Uh, what we're looking at right now is evaluating how to graph the risk premium. Uh, what we had discussed previously was about what the risk premium is, and now we're going to do it in this uh, graphical context. Now, when you look at the market for bonds, once again, was with most bonds, as we go by that traditional statement of, you know, it's all about supply and demand. So when we do this here, when we put up a general supply and demand framework, right, we have a downward sloping demand curve, an upward sloping supply curve. We have our quantity on the horizontal axis, price on the vertical, right? And then we, where our supply and demand meet, that gives us our equilibrium price and quantity, right? Now, that's in any market that we're really talking about, and this market that we're looking at right now is basically just saying it's the same exact thing. We're still looking in, in bonds, we're still looking for supply and demand. Of course, there is one difference. Okay. We still draw the setup almost identical, right? where we have our quantity of funds. This is our quantity of loanable funds along our horizontal axis, right? our quantity of loanable funds. And we still have an upward sloping supply curve, a downward sloping demand curve. And on the vertical axis, we still have price. But we define price a little bit different. Okay? In this regard, we define price as being an interest rate. Right? Because in order for me to give up my money, right, I'm going to give it up for a period of time, that's the context we can use it is as an interest rate. Right? That is what the cost of me to use your money is. And I take out a loan, you give it to me, I give it back to you along with an interest rate. Okay? Now, when we look at this is that we want to be able to understand why exactly our supply and demand curves are set up the way that they are. Now, when we set this up, is that we have our interest rate on the vertical axis, we have our quantity of loanable funds on the horizontal axis, and then we have an upward sloping supply curve. Okay. Our supply curve is upward sloping, right, because we know that we have, as interest rates rise, we know that uh, our quantity of loanable funds, we're going to supply more funds to the market. So we're going to send these funds out and allow us to uh, for others to use these funds. Okay? Now the question comes, why is this an upward sloping curve? Okay? And it's, it's not because, oh, I'm going to make more. It's because of this idea right here of opportunity cost. Right? And remember that our opportunity cost is the cost of the next best alternative. So when we look at this, if I have funds, let's say I have you know, $1,000 that I'm considering to spend. Right? I, have, I have options here. Is I can take these $1,000 and I can put them in my savings account. Okay? Alternatively, I could go spend them on something. Right? I could use this as my spending. Right? I could go to the movies, I could go out to the bar, I could do a whole bunch of other things. Right? But this is my spending. Now, when interest rates begin to rise, what ends up happening is that I reduce my amount of spending and then I end up saving more. Right? Because I'm, I'm going to give up some of my spending because savings, because I'm, I'm going to be receiving more. Okay? So that's why our supply curve is upward sloping. Now, when we look at our slope on the demand curve, okay, we have a downward sloping demand curve. We still have quantity of loanable funds on the horizontal axis and interest rate on the vertical axis. Now, when I typically ask this question about why is this downward sloping, I normally get this statement that it'll cost you less. Well, yes, that's true, but that's not exactly the answer here. Right? We know we have a lower interest rate. We want to be able to borrow more. But why exactly? Let's here put out a, an example here. Let's say that we own a whiskey distillery. Okay? We're looking at these. Along here is that we have a number of different projects, right? These are things, we did some analysis, we said, oh, these are some things that we're looking at doing, right? We can install a new still, which is going to have a, an internal return on investment of 22%. We have delivery truck of 12%, bar stools, apparel, new sign, etc. Okay? Now we're going to prioritize these things. And we're going to do the things that are going to increase value in our company. Okay? Now, if I'm looking at being able to borrow at, say, I have an interest rate to borrow, at say 11%. Okay. 
Right? This is, you know, I borrow funds, I have to pay back the bank 11%. Which of these things am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to build a new still, right? Because that new still is going to have a 22% return, my interest rate is 11%. Uh, I will also do a new delivery truck because I have a return on investment higher than my interest rate. But no, I'm not going to do any new bar stools because my return isn't as great as the amount I have to pay in my interest. It's not worth it to me. Same thing with the apparel and the new sign. Okay. Now, we have to say, all right, what happens when we change the interest rate? Let's say our interest rate falls. Okay? And now our new interest rate it falls down to, say, 5.5%. Okay? It, it goes in half. Does this change which projects I want to do? Well, of course, I'm still going to do the new still. Right? But it's going to impact some of these other things. I'm still going to do a new delivery truck because 12% is still much higher than 5.5%. Am I going to do bar stools? Yes, I'm, I am. Because my bar stools... They have a return of 6%, but they only cost me 5.5%. So yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I'm looking at buying new apparel for the workers at my distillery. And you know, my apparel is showing that we have a 10% return, right, which is much greater than 5.5%. And then the new sign here, no, I'm not going to do that. That's still less than my interest rate. So what we see here is that when interest rates are falling, right, when interest rates are falling, that means I am investing more. Right? So that's, that's what we're, we're showing here right now. And, okay? Now we're going to put this all together, and we are going to uh, basically draw two different markets here. The first of which, over on this side, we're going to have this side over here is going to be T-bills. So these are going to be the risk-free uh, securities, okay? And then on the other side over here, we're going to have, uh, on this side, we're going to have a corporate bond. This is just a general corporate investment grade bond, okay? This is the market for corporate bonds. This side over here on the left side is the market for treasury bills. We have interest rates associated with both of them. We understand be because of our basic formula, right, that our return is going to be equal to our risk-free rate plus that risk premium is that we have here an actually a difference okay and this difference here this is our risk premium okay right so that's our general graphing setup now then the question comes so we're looking at General Motors we're looking at corporations in general what happens if all of a sudden uh, there is, you know, this company seems to now be risky. Okay? This company seems to be risky, and at the given interest rate, companies or investors are now less willing to supply funds to this company. So what happens is our supply curve shifts back into the left, and we end up with a higher interest rate okay? and less funds being supplied. So what happens to our risk premium? Right? Naturally, this company is riskier. That means that our risk premium is widening. Okay? And that is the basic way that we set up on our risk premiums.